So in the vein of prayer requests, um, Ken and Cheryl were mentioning to me that Nathan, who's at the Bible College in New Zealand, who, by the way, I had a conversation with him Thursday night. We talked for about an hour. It was a great time to catch up with him. Um, I guess since Thursday, he was at the beach with some friends and stepped on something that uh, got a large puncture wound in his foot and so had to go to the urgent care there and, and receive some care. So just to, to pray for him as well. And um, I know that he would be grateful. So we will lift him up as well as we come to prayer this morning. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapters 34 and 35 as we continue to work our way through the book of Genesis. Uh, looks like we should be on this pace of two chapters a week for a while here. And so um, we are looking forward to what God has. There's some great stuff coming up as we move into the life of Joseph coming up here in just a few chapters. So chapter 34 this morning, I'd like to read for you down to verse uh, 12 or so. Uh, there's a, you know, a lot of scripture here, but we will go through it at a, at a higher level this morning. Verse 34, now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with livestock, with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. And make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions and yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let her, excuse me, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift and I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. So Lord, please add your understanding and your guidance to the scriptures that we are reading and that is your word and may it accomplish the purposes this morning in our lives for which you have intended so lord speak to us minister to us instruct us in jesus name amen so one thing we've been saying as we've been going along here through the book of genesis particularly these last few weeks in the life of Jacob. We know that when Jacob was born, of course, his name means sneaky thief or supplanter or deceiver. And we've been talking about the fact that Jacob is slowly learning over the course of many years to walk with God. God's been taking him through a number of very difficult circumstances to bring him to a point of breaking. And you may recall last week as Pastor Mitch was sharing with us that when he went out to meet his brother Esau on his way back, he, he was leaving uh, Laban, his father-in-law, where he had spent a great many years serving, uh, trying to build up his family. He, he went there to get a wife. You may recall his father and his mother had sent him back to his mother's people to get a wife, and as he got there, he found a woman. Her name was Rachel, but she was the younger of two daughters, and then uh, Jacob, being the deceiver, the master deceiver, met a man more cunning and more sly than himself, and that was his future father-in-law, Laban. He had served seven years for her because he had nothing f uh, for which to give a dowry to, to get his wife, and at the end of that seven years, they had the wedding, 
And on the wedding night, her father deceived them, sent in the older daughter, Rachel, excuse me, Leah, and then uh, he woke up in the morning and found out that he had uh, gotten married to the wrong woman, and he was deceived, and so he uh, served another seven years for Rachel, and then um, he ended up serving uh, even longer, so he was there for 20 years, you know, building up his flocks, and uh, God was, you know, building himself into Jacob, teaching Jacob that deception and self-reliance, which the world teaches, are not the way that God has for us. It's not the way that he has intended for us. And so Jacob was brought several times to a point of breaking by having the carpet pulled out from under his feet, by having the circumstances that he had tried so hard to manipulate uh, pulled on him in a different direction. You know, he loved a woman and wanted to marry her. He got the wrong woman. He married that woman. They began to have children, but you see, Leah had children first, and the Lord closed the womb of Rachel. And then he opened the womb of Leah, and, he, and it says there in the scriptures as we studied it that Leah was unloved, and the Lord saw that. And so the first four children as God was beginning to populate what we now know as the 12 tribes of Israel came from Leah, not from Rachel. And then as we read that story, we saw how God was unfolding his plan for the situation. And then both Rachel and Leah had given their maids to Jacob for wives as well. And so they had 12 children at that point. They had one daughter and 11 sons. Benjamin had not been born yet. He's coming up in chapter 35 here. And so as we've been going through this, we've been seeing, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that Jacob is being broken. He's being conformed to the image of Christ. And let me say this at the very outset today, just to remind us, to recalibrate us, that as believers in Christ, as people who love God, we are going to be conformed to his image. God is going to work his will in us. And we can cooperate with him in that process and be obedient and open our hearts to him and read his word and say, yes, Lord. Or we can kick against the goads. We can fight against that process. We can try to do it ourselves. We can say, Lord, I don't like your plan. I'm going to do my plan because I like it a little better. I'm a little more comfortable because I know where my plan's going to lead me. And here's the reality. You don't know where your plan's going, going to lead you, do you? If you've lived any length of time, you know that your plan mostly has not worked out the way you thought it was going to work out. Mine hasn't. It's not that I had a grand plan for my life, but every time I think I have a little plan, I can see down the road a little piece, and I'm like, well, we'll do this, or I'm going to do that. It just, it just never works, at least not the way I planned it. And so we have to be open to the things of God. Uh, one person wrote, the Lord cannot fully bless a man or a person until he has first conquered him. God conquered Jacob by weakening him. Remember in the story last week, Jacob was on his way to meet his brother, the very brother who he deceived. And he was fearful. And as he was on his way to that encounter with his brother, he encountered the Lord. And he and the Lord had a literal wrestling match. He wrestled with the angel of the Lord. It was the Lord Jesus himself in a, in a pre-incarnate appearance to Jacob. And as they wrestled, uh, you remember at the end of that wrestling match, the Lord touched his hip and gave him a limp, a limp that would stay with him for life. And God weakened him and showed him, in your weakness you shall find strength. And isn't this what Paul the Apostle wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he says, for, you know, I had a thorn in the flesh and I sought the Lord and I asked him to speak to me and to remove this thorn from my flesh. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient and my strength is made, my power is made perfect in your weakness. And so that's what happened to Jacob. And so God conquered Jacob by weakening him. So don't despise the difficulties and the trials and the testings, because you see, God is got, has got work to do in my life and in yours. G. Campbell Morgan, speaking of Jacob's experience, said, the crippling that crowns uh, and interpreted Israel to mean a God-mastered man 
I'm inclined to agree with him. In other words, the name Israel we, we looked at last week means governed by God. Uh, this man, G. Campbell Morgan, as he was looking at the situation says, this crippling crowned him, and I believe another way of looking at it is a God-mastered man. And so today, like Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, meaning governed by God, or if you accept G. Campbell Morgan's approach, a God-mastered man or person. When God rules our lives, then he can trust us with his power, for only those who are under his authority have the right to exercise his authority. You may recall in the story in the last couple of weeks that Jacob was told by the Lord to get out from the place that he was at and to go back to the place that was called Bethel. But in his journey last week, he stopped short. He stopped in this place where Shechem was. And for whatever reason, he bought land there. He settled down there. We don't know why he didn't follow through and go back all the way to Bethel. He was really within just around 30 miles or so of Bethel, but he stopped short of it. So now as he stopped there and he spent time in this place where God did not call him to be, God indeed called him to go back to Bethel, now we find some things playing out in his family, <coughs> excuse me, and we see here in chapter 34, now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. We believe Dinah was probably somewhere between 16 and 18 at this point in time, and as you might Remember of your teen years, you know, maybe we get a little wanderlust in our hearts and we're like, you know, I'm kind of tired of this place. I want to blow this joint. I want to get out of here and go do my own thing and spread my wings. So Dinah did that. She decided to leave the comfort and the care and the covering of her family's home and go out to see the world. Now, this is in part because Jacob is not where he's supposed to be. He should have moved his family the additional 30 miles all the way to Bethel, where God called him to go, but instead he, he made camp there. So now we're, uh, you know, when Jacob left um, Laban, you know, he was about 30 years into that process, and now we're, we're probably close to 10 years down the road, even more, when chapter 34 happens. And so... Leah goes out to see the daughters of the land. This would be like, just try to consider this in your mind if you're a parent and if you're a child. Think about this as well. Child meaning you're not old enough yet to go do those things. This would be the equivalent of our kids saying to us at maybe 16, you know, I'm going to go to Las Vegas. I'm going to go to Hollywood. And I'm just going to go out there and see what happens. I just want to see the world. I want to see what all that stuff is about. I want to see the bright lights. I want to see the people. I want to experience life. And that's what Dinah did here. And Jacob's choice to stay in this place, we're about to find out, has serious consequences for his family. In fact, in this chapter, chapter 34, the name of God, the name of the Lord is not mentioned even once. And surely the wisdom of the Lord is absent from this chapter. In fact, when we stop short, when we're not following God, when we decide to do it our way, we put ourselves and those connected with us in great danger. And that's what happened here. So when Shechem, the son of Hamor, verse 2, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. This is a very kind way of saying that he took her and raped her. And you can imagine when this young woman left the comfort of her family and the protection of her family, she put herself at great risk. So uh, Jacob and Leah, her parents, did not exercise good parental oversight, but also this young lady, Dinah, did not exercise good oversight. Perhaps, we don't know, we're not told in the story, perhaps they said, no, don't go, and perhaps they even forbade her to go. But she went. And I'm not saying that her being violated in this way was her fault. I'm saying that these decisions lead to things. 
So when she went out to see the daughters of the land, we remember that Jacob had brought his family to this promised land. God didn't really want him here. And Jacob chose a place to live for all the wrong reasons. Perhaps Jacob wanted to be close to the city and Bethel was not. Though the city had a strong and an ungodly influence. And now we're beginning to see the impact of that ungodly influence. You know, in Psalm 1, perhaps you know this psalm, it says, Blessed is the man, or the person, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. When we choose to go the way of the world, when we choose to take ourselves out from underneath the authority of God's word, when we choose to leave the confines and the covering of our family before it's time, we put ourselves at risk. And it says here that this man's soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to her. So the way this is written, it makes it seem like he was not really a, a bad man in a sense, but he just sort of lived according to his lust. He was an ungodly man. And he saw her and he took her and he lay with her. He violated her. And then he spoke kindly to her and said that he wanted her to be his wife. And he went to his father saying, get me this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now, let's just stop right there for a moment. I can tell you as a father of three girls that if I heard that happen, I would probably do something very ungodly in that moment. Right, anybody have daughters here? Maybe just a couple, okay. You wanna protect your kids, right? But we find here now his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. What's going on, Jacob? Why is there no reaction? I believe his heart has grown cold. So that even his own family is not under the protection of God because he's not living under the protection of God. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and they were grieved and very angry. I love the King James here. They were very wroth because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. And let me just say this. When God appointed heads, do not take appropriate leadership. It creates a void which is often sin filled sinfully. I'll read that again. When God appointed heads... Do not take appropriate leadership. It creates a void which is often filled sinfully. In other words, when there is a void of strong, godly, biblical leadership and obedience in the family, namely with the father, but also with the mother, then bad things will happen. Because in that vacuum, in that absence of doing the right thing before God, we open ourselves up to the ways of the world to the ways of Satan. But Hamor spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter, please give him to uh, him as a wife. So Hamor now negotiating with Jacob and make marriages with us, give us your daughters and take our daughters to yourselves. So now, you know, you know, the Lord had told him that they were a holy people. The Lord had told Jacob that he was going to bless him, bless him and make him a great nation, but the Lord had told him to go to Bethel. And so now he's here, and there's a great threat as they've come. They've taken Dinah, and they are now pr making the proposition, hey, let's, let's come together, and let's sort of intermarry our people. Let's form an alliance. And this is not something that God had intended so you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes. In other words, I see you're angry. I get it. But let's figure out how we can make this right. Can, can we come to an agreement that will make you all wealthy men? As if money could make this right. As if material wealth could atone for the sin of what happened when this young man took Dinah in his lust and laid with her. 
Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gifts and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. In other words, his son had come to him and said, daddy, I want her. And he was doing whatever he could to get this woman for his son. You see, this was far more than a matter between a young Canaanite man and Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. If they married, it would set the pattern for future marriages between Jacob's family and the people of Canaan. The result would be the eventual and complete assimilation of Jacob's family into the Canaanite culture. Remember, the Canaanite culture was the most pagan culture on the face of the earth at that point in time. So you shall dwell with us and trade in it, he said. The future of this covenant family as a distinct people was at risk. They acted as if money and marriage could make her disgrace go away. But verse 13, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And they said to him, we cannot do this thing. So they've got him over a barrel. They know that they want Dinah. So now the brothers are using Dinah as a bargaining chip Now, where did they learn such deceit and trickery, I wonder? They learned it from their father, right? We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us, and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. Now, this is the brothers speaking on behalf of the father. Again, Jacob, where is he? He's absent. He's standing there, but he is not participating in what's happening. So they felt justified uh, in their deceit because the men of Shechem treated Dinah, their sister, as a prostitute, but they prostituted the sign of God's covenant for their own violent purpose. You see, they had no intent of doing what they said, did they? They weren't going to go through with this. They were just using Dinah and circumcision as a bargaining chip to trick them into doing this procedure, this surgical procedure. And when they did this procedure and then they were incredibly sore and unable basically to walk or do anything, then they were going to go in and attack, right? We know this from the story. The words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son. So they said, yes. Um, So they went and they did it. They came to the gate of the city, spoke with the men saying, okay, here's the deal, guys. We got a great proposition for you. These people are going to come in and they're going to marry with us. And by the way, we're going to get some fresh women for our men. So this is a good thing, right? All you guys want wives, get out of the gene pool here and get some other women into the fold. And while we do that, by the way, as they've already moved here, they're going to begin to trade with us and we're going to partake of their wealth because this is a very wealthy man. And so there's a great economic benefit to us here. And so he puts all these bargaining chips on the table and he says, oh, and by the way, there's one little condition. All of you men have to get circumcised. So we have to do this. So everybody get in line and let's get this done. And so that's What happened here in this next section? Verse 34, will not their livestock and their property and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them. We gotta do this one little thing and then they will dwell with us. So they heeded Hamor and every male was circumcised and all who went out of the gate and it came to pass on the third day when they were in great pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, So if you look and you read, these were all the children of Leah. Uh, Each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. The boldness with which they executed their foul plan shows the hardness of their hearts. You see, they were executing God's justice, so they thought, in their way. In fact, this was what we might call in the movies today, vigilante justice. And so they killed Hamor and Shechem and his son with the edge of the sword. In fact, I'm quite sure they probably went to their house first. 
And they took Dinah from Shechem's house, and they went out. And the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They were just going to take everything. They took their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, and what was in the city and what was in the field, and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives. And they took them captive and plundered them, even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Now, boys, you've troubled me. I mean, his sons just committed mass murder. Eh, You guys trouble me. You've made me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they're going to come and they're going to come against me and kill me. Haven't we heard this story before? Where we we saw it with Abraham, we saw it with Isaac, now we see it with Jacob. This is the, the third or fourth time we've seen it with Jacob where he's like in fear of his life. And he's like, you guys are all putting me at risk. And he's got this self-centered view because he's not following the Lord, because he's not walking with the Lord, because he's not where he should have been in his journey with God. One commentator said this, and who knows, only the Lord knows, but he said, had Jacob and his family been in Bethel where they belonged, this tragedy might not have occurred. And while that's true, and I agree with that, you know, we can do this to ourselves, can't we? When we go through something and something happens that's bad and we begin to second guess our decisions and we look back and we say, it's all my fault, I made this decision and and all of that. And, And it may be, and certainly in this case it was. But sometimes things just happen. Sometimes it's not our fault. Sometimes it's just sin and the way of the world. In this case, it was, I believe, Jacob's fault because he was not where they should have been. So now this terrible situation concludes. We move into chapter 35. Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now remember when Jacob had left his father's house and he was on his way to Laban's house to find a wife that God met him and at that time he named the place Bethel and he had slept there and he'd used a rock for his pillow and he had made an altar with that rock and he had poured oil upon it and worshiped the Lord there at Bethel then he went and he spent that 20 years or so with his uncle or with yeah with his uncle And then as he was coming back, he was back at this place, Bethel, and had an encounter with the Lord when he had uh, gone, well, when he had gone out to meet his brother. And now, um, actually, that wasn't at Bethel, but he said, go and uh, rise and go to Bethel. So the Lord now speaking to him after 10 years of disobedience, living in this land, go up to Bethel and dwell there. God spoke to him before, now he's speaking to him again go to Bethel. This is God giving him another chance. And isn't God like this, where he just gives us second and third and fourth and nth chances to do the right thing, to hear his voice, to listen, to obey. And so God giving another opportunity here to Jacob you see, for, for years, Jacob had lingered a mere 30 miles away from Bethel and had paid dearly for his disobedience. But now the Lord spoke to him and told him to move to Bethel, to settle down there. Jacob already knew that Bethel was God's appointed place for him and his family, but he had been slow to obey. So Jacob said to his household in verse 2, and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Remember when they had departed from Laban's household that Rachel had stolen her father's idols? It is likely that Rachel, his beloved wife, had brought those idols into his house and that those idols had now multiplied because they were living in Shechem. Shechem was a part of the land of Canaan. Canaan was the capital of foreign gods. And so now during this 10 years that his family was where they should not have been, his household has been polluted with pagan worship, with idolatry. Now let's just stop for a moment and consider something about idols. 
in these times, it was a lot easier to know if people were worshiping idols because they had a physical thing. They had an idol. They had a statue in their house, and they worshiped that statue. They bowed down to that statue. But you see, for us today, it's a little different, isn't it? How many of you have a little gold idol in your house that you bow down to? Raise your hand right now. Anybody? Okay. But we do have idols, don't we? Here's our idols. Can, can be anything. This is going to mess with you. I'm sorry. I'm messing with myself. Television. Intellect. Right? Our ability to think and reason. Sometimes we trust so much in our ability to reason. When faith, which is both intellectual and spiritual, faith often, we've talked about this as we've been going through Genesis, faith often defies logic. We, we've talked about some of the examples. You know, God told Abraham, get out from the place you're at, from your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. Where, Lord? We've got to rent the U-Haul. Where are we going? You just go, I'll show you where you're supposed to go. That doesn't make sense to us. When the, the children of Israel were, were told to walk around the, the city of Jericho, right? It didn't make any sense what God had told them to do. So many times God speaks and he says, go and do something, do this, just follow me, trust my word. But we're like, but Lord, just, can you give me a little more? I want the plan, I want the timeline. How long, where, when, how much is it gonna cost? And God says, no, you trust me. If I tell you all those things, you'll trust in yourself and your ability to execute a plan, but I want you to follow me in faith. So Jacob told all of his household to put away their foreign gods, to put away their idols. You see, this is a renovation, a reformation that's happening. It's a revival that God is calling Jacob to. Purge yourself, purify yourselves, change your garments. You see, the, the, the garments in the Bible, when it's spoken of in this way, is always referring to our character, our moral values, our manner of living. And when God tells people to put off and put on, as he did in the New Testament as well as the Old, he's saying, purify yourselves with new garments, take off the filthy garments, put on the new garments, make a change. Many of the problems in the Christian life and in local churches result from incomplete obedience. We know what the Lord wants us to do. We start to do it and then we stop. When we don't continue in our obedience to God uh, to accomplish his will, even what we've done starts to die because it was incomplete, because it wasn't in faith. In verse 3, he says, Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been, been with me in the way which I have gone. So Jacob acknowledging that even though he was in a place where he shouldn't have been, that God was still with him. God was still preserving and protecting him. It's hard to think that things could have been much worse than what just happened, but it could have been. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. Why did they give him their jewelry? Because some of their jewelry was acquired at the pagan markets. Some of their jewelry probably had symbols on them that were to foreign Canaanite gods. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. God was protecting him as they journeyed. Perhaps this was the reason Jacob stopped where he did 10 years ago. Perhaps he was afraid to pass through that region because of the other peoples. And yet here we see the terror of the Lord was upon them. God was protecting Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and he called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alan Bakuth. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. So now God had spoken to him. 
And now he appeared to him once he got to Bethel. So again, an example to you and me, obey the voice of the Lord, go, take the journey, do the trip. And when it is time, God will provide further information. He will provide further instruction. One person wrote this about this experience. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram. Excuse me. Perhaps all of us have places that are especially meaningful to us because of spiritual experiences we have had. We might even call them a holy site. But we must understand a holy site must never take the place of a holy God. To visit a special location and try to recapture old blessings is to live in the past. Let's ask God for new blessings and a new revelation of himself. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that in my past experiences, the Lord has spoken to me at the beach. And I love going to the beach and sitting there and staring at the ocean and praying and seeking the face of the Lord. But you know, the Lord can speak to me just as easily in my office at home, in my garage, in my backyard, right? God can speak to us anywhere. I like doing that at times because for me, it just allows me that sort of change of scenery for a moment to, to get out and to seek the face of the Lord. Maybe for you, it's taking a walk in the forest, or maybe it's going up to the mountains or taking a hike. Whatever it is, understand that God wants us to seek him. He wants us to draw near to him. And so Jacob, now as he comes to Bethel, God said to him, verse 10, your name is Jacob, reminding him of a previous experience, and your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be called your name. So earlier, when God spoke to Jacob and said, your name is now Israel at the wrestling match on his way to meet his brother, and he said, your name Israel will be called governed by God, it would seem that Jacob did not think of himself in the light of the name that God had given him. He began, he continued to act under the name of Jacob. He continued to act thinking of himself the way he had always been. Jacob, the supplanter, the sneaky thief, the deceiver. And God is saying to him, now listen, I gave you a name. Your name is Israel. It means governed by God. I want you to act as a person who is governed by God. The name Jacob is now dead to me. It should be dead to you. Now we are told in the book of Revelation that one day in the kingdom of God, you and I will be given a new name. And I've heard people say, and I don't know if this is true, that on certain occasions, perhaps the Lord has revealed to them what their new name is to be. And I don't know about that. It says in the book of Revelation, that'll be yet future. But you can rest assured that when we receive that new name, it will be as God truly sees us. It will be God's vision for us. So even though we don't know what that new name is, we can certainly begin to live as that person that God is calling us to be. In fact, as we have become believers in Christ, it says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Behold, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. So we are already called to be new and different people. You see, God didn't save us to leave us the way we are. If we can look at our lives, if other people can look at our lives as we now say, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm marked by the name of Christ, I've come to him, I've believed in him, I've received forgiveness of my sins, I've repented and I've turned and I'm following him. If people can look at us and say, I don't see any difference in the pre-dean and the post-dean, that's a problem. There should be a difference. We should be marked. I'm not saying we should, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could walk around and have an aura around our head and people could go, yeah, okay, that person's a Christian. But that's not the way God intended it. He said, by your fruits, by your works, people will know. He said that the world will know that you're my church, that you're my children because of your love for one another. You see, there would be something different. There's a different quality in our lives. Why? Because the spirit of God has come into our lives and we've been born again. 
We have new life. And Jacob now has to be reminded, your name shall be Israel. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. So now God is re-rehearsing to him the promise that he gave to Abraham, that he repeated to Isaac, and now he's repeating to Jacob. I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I'm now giving to you, and to your descendants after you, I'm going to give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone. He poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. So this is the third time Jacob has been here to this place. Maybe the third time's the charm. Maybe he's going to understand it's not about the place, it's about the encounter with God himself. God is so gracious and merciful in repeating himself time and time again to Jacob and calling him to himself. You see, he's just continually working on Jacob. He's sort of beating that drum. He's just saying to Jacob over and over and over, you're not who you once were. You are now who I want you to be. I want you to walk in my ways. I want you to follow my path. I want you to live in an obedient way before me. So God spoke with Jacob. And then they journeyed, verse 16, from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had a hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So again, thinking about the beginning, thinking about how Jacob had wanted things to be. Rachel was his beloved wife, and yet here, up to this point in time, she had only given him one son. Now she's giving him a second son, Benjamin. Ben-Oni means son of my sorrow or son of my trouble. But the word Benjamin as uh, Jacob called him, would mean son of my right hand. And so now Benjamin is born. Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Ephrath means fruitful and Bethlehem means house of bread. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it, and now the sons of Jacob were 12. So we're going along, everything's great. It seems Jacob's repented. He's going through a personal renewal and a revival. He's listened to the voice of the Lord. He's begun to obey him, and now his son, his oldest son, Reuben, decides to act in a way that is offensive to his father. He took his father's concubine, and lay with her. When this would happen in a household, it would si usually signal that the, the baton of, of patriarchy was being passed along to the next generation. But that wasn't happening here. So now as we stop and just rewind for a moment back to when the brothers were there uh, dealing with Shechem and Hamor, and making the negotiations. You know, Reuben was a part of that, and it would seem that Jacob, because of his abdication of his moral and spiritual responsibility and authority for his family, is continuing to have lingering negative effects, and that his son, Reuben, now acts against him and takes his concubine. And in a sense, is sort of symbolizing, I'm gonna take the, the lead role from you, Dad. And Israel heard about it, The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, 
The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Pat and Aram. You see, if we obey the Lord only for what we get out of it and not because he is worthy and not out of love and obedience, then our hearts and our motives are wrong. We become the kind of people Satan accused Job of being. Remember when Satan went before the Lord in Job chapters 1 and 2. He went the first time and was given permission to, to test Job. But the second time he went back, he said to the Lord, you know, God, he only serves you because you bless him. If you let me have a crack at him, I'll get him to turn. I'll prove to you that his heart is fickle toward you. And God gave him permission and said, okay, but just spare his life. And we know if we've read that story, what Satan did to Job, he completely decimated his life. His 10 children, his goods, everything was burned up. Everything he had was taken from him. If we obey the Lord only for what we get out of it and not because he is worthy, our love and our obedience, for out, for out of love and obedience, then our own hearts and motives are wrong. You see, this is where idols come in. This, this is where our allegiance to the Lord is tested. I've had the, the sad experience over so many years of being with people, walking with people through terrible situations, that they become angry and bitter toward the Lord because things have happened in their lives. A death of someone close to them, a tragedy such as a house burning down, a health issue, cancer. And remember, all of these things fall into many categories. One, we live in a sin-filled, sin-marred world. Two, we, we could actually be reaping the consequences of our sin. Three, God may be using these things to shape us into the kind of people he wants us to be. Perhaps we veered off course and it's taken drastic measures to pull us back into the alignment to where God wants us to go and be. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre or Kirith Abra, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac, Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. In chapter 35, we find something very significant for Jacob that I believe the Lord wants to speak to us about, and that issue is personal revival. Where are you in your walk? Are you following the Lord? Are you obeying him completely? Or is there a partial obedience in your life? Have you come to the place in your faith with God that you are willing to trust him no matter what, even when things in his word don't make sense to you? Many times I've read scriptures and I read them and I think, it's a great story, but I don't know if I could do that. Lord, I don't know if you were speaking to me or calling me to follow you in that way if I could do that. Could I do that? I don't know. But if God <clears throat> tests me, <clears throat> if he tries me in that way, then the only re right response is to respond in faith even in a faith that may not make sense, that may not follow sound logic. You see, it's better to follow the Lord, to be, a, as Psalm 84 says, to be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to be, live a thousand days elsewhere. Aren't we seeing this through the lives of the patriarchs here in the times where they walked with God and the times they didn't walk with God? Abraham went down to Egypt, got into a mess of trouble, came back, Again, had the, uh, another king he came into an encounter with, got into trouble, came back. Isaac did the same thing. Now Jacob's doing the same thing. We have to follow the Lord. And just because we don't understand something, just because something doesn't make sense to us, doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's not the Lord.
I think almost everything, <laughs> I'm speaking just that, maybe the board can back me up here. Mitch has been with me for a long time. You know, when we've made these decisions to, a number of years ago, we were over at Commerce Park North, and we felt like the Lord was speaking to us, not because we were busting out of the place, but that we needed to move, and we moved up to South River Road, and we did a, a, you know, a project there and met there for many years, five, six, seven years, I forget, and then we felt like the Lord was speaking to us to come here to this location, and as I think back through it, as I have many times, you know, and, and we've talked about it on the board. We're like, you know, we know the Lord. We know that we collectively heard the voice of God. We know we, that he told us to move here to do this thing. And yet the experience we've been through this, this last uh, three years or so since we've moved here has been so up and down that it has been incredibly troubling, you know, because the things that we felt the Lord had spoken to us have not come to pass. But that doesn't mean that they won't just means that we have to wait and we have to be patient and we have to be faithful and that's just one thing in, in my life and in the, the life and the journey of us as a church but what about us as individuals you see the same thing happens doesn't it we have to wait for the Lord we have to be faithful we have to persevere and maybe today maybe the Lord is speaking to us either collectively or individually and saying it's time to clean house to get rid of some idols to purge, to worship the Lord, and then to listen for his voice. And maybe God will do for you and for me what he did for Jacob, which is to repeat what he already said and to reinforce a message that had previously been given. Maybe the Lord will speak new marching orders. Maybe he will give us new direction in our lives. Either way, I really don't see any other choice. You know, I don't want to one day go to the doctor and get the news, okay, you've got six months to live, and then go into despair and, and go into a hole and hide for six months until I die, should such a thing happen. As long as gives, God gives me strength and breath, I want to serve him. And if that means I have to sit here in a wheelchair with a tank of oxygen to preach the word of God, I, I hope and pray that's what I would do. What does God spoken to your heart? What is he calling you to do? How is he calling you to follow him? Personal revival. Put your nose in this book. You're saying, but I don't understand. A lot of it doesn't make sense. Doesn't matter. Didn't make sense to me at the first either. But you keep reading it. You keep praying. You keep seeking the Lord and say, God, speak to me. God, minister to me. God, show me. And if you're hungry, and you want to know the Lord, and you want to follow him all the days of your life, and if you, if you want to fall across the finish line into his arms exhausted, he will be there to receive you. So let's follow the Lord. Let's do what Jacob did. Let's repent and turn and remember and go back to our first love and be obedient to the Lord. And maybe if the Lord's spoken, spoken something to you in the past that you've not done, maybe today is a reminder that you need to go back and do that thing which he has spoken to you. So I would encourage you today to seek the Lord, to trust him, to follow him, to ask him to help you. Be like that man that Jesus saw one day in the temple that man who stood there and he beat his breast and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinful man. God loves a broken and a contrite heart. And he will be gracious and merciful to his people who call upon his name. If my people will humble themselves and call upon my name, I will meet them. I will speak to them. If they will repent and return, I'll be there waiting with open arms. Amen. Lord, we love you. Thank you for how you have ministered to us today. Thank you for this beautiful passage of scripture and the continuing story of Jacob. Lord, help us to follow you. Lord, if there's anything we need to do here today in terms of repentance or uh, cleaning of house, as it were, throwing out some idols, Lord, whatever it may be, help us with those things. Help us to identify them. Help us to identify, Lord, those deep-seated attitudes and ways of thinking uh, that are harmful to our relationship with you, that we might cast them aside and follow you with our whole heart. 
And Lord, if there be any here this morning who have never trusted in you, they've never met Jesus, then Lord, let for them today be that day of salvation where they hear your voice gently saying, come to me, my child, and receive the forgiveness that you so desperately long for. And Lord, may they come and give their hearts to you. And may you save them and turn their lives around and set their feet on the right path. And if that's you this morning, just simply just reach out to God in your heart and pray and ask him to meet you right now, and he will. And so, Lord, we love you. We bless you. Thank you for this time. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord with one final closing song. And then if you need to speak with anyone or pray with anyone, Pastor Mitch is here. I'm here. We'd love to pray with you and speak with you.